Um, it's really special to have Dr. Rajesh Kishwani here from uh, Northwestern University. Um, he's a leader in the field in endoscopy and uh, quality, and we're really appreciative of him spending a few days with us in Southern California, and he's going to be discussing controversies and breakthroughs of colonoscopy. So please welcome Dr. Kishwani. All right, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's really a pleasure and uh, it's an honor to kick off this amazing program. Uh, so I, you know, I did change the title up a little bit, as we said, it's not just controversies, there's a lot of breakthroughs happening as well. And so we're gonna talk about you know, colonoscopy as it is in 2019 and where we're going. So I'm gonna break this down into really three parts because the third part we're talking about in a different uh, talk later today. So improving polyp detection colon polypectomy, really where are we going with polyp removal, and then colon inspection, detection, and re resection, our computers to the rescue, uh, which uh, we'll, we'll touch on as well. Post polypectomy bleeds is a very hot topic as well, and we'll talk about that in the adverse events talk uh, later this morning. So improving polyp detection, you know, uh, I, I think about colonoscopy a lot. I'm an interventional endoscopist, and, and majority of my practice is pancreatic or biliary work, but the majority of what we do as gastroenterologists is colonoscopy, and our, one of our main goals is improving polyp detection. And it's humbling that after all these years of doing it, there's still room for all of us to improve, right? And so I think about this a lot because we talk a lot about how we can improve polyp detection, and I, I sort of have thought about we hear lots of complex things and lots of easy things. And it's important to always take a step back and try to implement the things that are easiest first. So that's on the left-hand side of the slide, right? Make sure, and as you heard yesterday really well, uh, a really good talk on split dose bowel preparation, it's just mandatory to be utilizing that in your institution. Don't worry about being on the right side of the uh, figure about you know, uh, AI and computers if you aren't you know, uh, implementing the basics on the left side. So split dose bowel preparation, you know, quality metric measurement, um, adequate training, We'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, water immersion, but there's also cecal retroflexion, there's mucosal exposure devices. There's so much we can do, but we should really try to implement the easiest things first. But that's not what 2019 is about. 2019 is about you know, uh, implementing novel things. So it's important to understand that colonoscopy uh, has three you know, main components when we're trying to find colon polyps. One, again, is the adequate cleaning of the colon. Second is distending the colon, and the third is fold examination. And this all takes time, as you know. And so uh, one of the, the big things that a lot of people around the country have been doing is trying to quantify colonoscopy quality by how well people do these core things that Doug Rex uh, you know, sort of made up in 2000. And uh, what we've been doing at our center is actually moving towards what the surgeons have do, been doing quite a bit, which is actually giving people feedback on their technical skill. So not just telling people that their ADR is 35%, but telling them how they do on these core metrics of cleaning, fold examination, things of that sort, and giving them associated didactics. So this would be an example of how we have been giving that feedback. We tell them um, their fold examination score is slightly below the median. This is what a bad examination behind colon folds would look like, and we explain why that's bad. Um, and then we give them examples of what a good examination behind colon folds would be, you know, looking uh, up and below and uh, all around all the folds. And we've shown that, you know, giving people more structured feedback than just ADR is really helpful for people who are lower detectors of polyps, increases their ADR by about 3%, right? So this is another additive thing to how we can improve quality. And I actually think that this is going to be a, a lot where we go over the next five to 10 years, is giving people useful feedback on their skills, both from colonoscopy, ERCP, you know, the gamut. We need to get more uh, structured feedback to help us get better. So what are other ways are there out there to improve ADR? Uh, we saw a very nice example uh, yesterday from uh, Dr. Chang about water-aided colonoscopy. This is one of those interesting things that there's actually a lot of good data supporting it, but the uptake of it has been actually quite uh, suboptimal. This is a nice meta-analysis that was just published. And so the concept of water-aided uh, colonoscopy is that you're distending the colon, you're also cleansing the colon on the way in, and you're able to find polyps, right? 
This meta-analysis came out last year showing that, you know, when they compare these, uh, these options, which is water exchange, which is essentially uh, putting water into the colon on the way in and suctioning water out as, at the same time, so essentially cleaning the colon on the way in versus water immersion, air, uh, air insufflation, or CO2 insufflation, water exchange uh, had about an 8% higher ADR compared to the next, uh, next uh, uh, contender, which is water immersion. And when you do this kind of complicated network meta-analysis, the, the dominant strategy is water exchange. I would say there's probably no bigger disconnect between how we perform colonoscopy um, with what the best data shows. I, I, I know no one in my center who still performs water exchange, including myself, but all the data is supporting this. So I think it's going to require more people showing this rather than the champions, because most of the work has been done by a few endoscopists, showing that this is more generalizable. But uh, this is something to think about. Maybe, we've been, maybe we're really going to fundamentally change how we perform uh, uh, insertion during colonoscopy. So what about other ways to detect polyps? Where else are we moving? So chromoendoscopy has been around for quite a while. Um, this study came out about a decade ago by uh, uh, Charles Cahi in, in Indiana um, and colleagues and showed that if you do chromoendoscopy, you can improve the detection of diminutive adenomas. But no one changed their practice because chromoendoscopy is actually quite uh, onerous to perform. And so although there was a signal there that people were interested in, it didn't identify more advanced adenomas, so it didn't change practice. But where we've changed is that chromoendoscopy may now become an option that's really tolerable for the colonoscopist, right? It was always fine for the patient, uh, but it was very difficult for the colonoscopist. Now there's the idea that we can uh, give the tablets, as you may have seen in the recent gastro article, with the PrEP, it'll give the patient uh, that uh, dye during the colonoscopy, and we can identify these adenomas. And this article just got, uh, came in to, to pre, uh, uh, publish this year, which showed about a 9% increase in adenoma detection when you have uh, this uh, uh, chromoendoscopy uh, through tablet form. Now, whenever you look at these papers on adenoma detection rate increases, it's important to understand the population of endoscopists you're dealing with. So the, you know, the placebo baseline ADR here is 48%. And no one has any idea whether it matters to go from 48% to 56% ADR, right? So this is a proof of concept, but really what the next step is showing in people who have more modest ADRs, you know, 20 to 30%, where we really do want them to improve, whether something like this can be helpful. But this is something you're going to hear more and more about, um, is, is chromoendoscopy making a comeback. And, and other things are making a comeback, really. It's all about you know, things we talked about 10 years ago that were negative now coming back again. And that, and that includes lights, um, which is like NBI, um, BLI, and then devices, which uh, Dr. Muthasami talked about a little bit about yesterday. I'll recap it for those who weren't there. So narrowband imaging is this concept that you can filter uh, the lights into uh, just the relevant ones that will help you uh, highlight the vascular pattern on top of the polyps, right? And so the, the, the big issue in the past was NBI was pretty good at looking at a polyp, but when you tried to look at the whole colon, it's a very dark, you see on the right, uh, very dark uh, um, image quality when you had uh, NBI in the older generation colonoscope. With the newer generation colonoscope, much, e much brighter illumination, you're able to actually examine the colon in better detail. And a lot of data coming out, this meta-analysis really literally just came out in the last few weeks. Um, and it shows that ADR uh, is, uh, increases uh, when you use NBI for withdrawal compared to white light endoscopy, right? And so that, that is actually a fundamental shift from how many of us do colonoscopy, which is uh, withdrawal during, uh, uh, with white light. And this is a more positive finding when you have a really high quality bowel preparation. And when you think about just the patients who got the uh, NBI withdrawal using the second generation NBI system, the ADR was about, again, that 6% difference. NBI ADR was 53%, white light was 47%. Again, the caveat being these are really high detectors who are doing all these studies. You, we need to take these studies from experts and, and to put it into all of our hands um, to see how we do with this as well. But remember, this is another important thing to think about, that NBI has made a real big comeback um, because of that better illumination. 
And there's really multiple uh, randomized studies also showing BLI, which is a, a Fuji system uh, option that also improves uh, adenoma detection compared to white light endoscopy. And then there's also something called linked color imaging, which is another post-processing technique which has been shown to be superior to white light, endos uh, white light endoscopy. But uh, there, it was a, a nice study uh, out of DDW this year uh, for, for those who are interested in this topic, showing that when you compared LCI uh, to NBI head-to-head, -head, NBI was superior in terms of adenoma protection. Um, for most of us, this doesn't matter. We're already married to one system or the other. We're married to either N uh, a Fuji or Olympus scope in our center. But uh, of, the, of the two, NBI outperformed LCI. It's very rare to see a head-to-head -head, uh, comparison between two different processors. So a lot of work to do this. Um, and, but, but lights in general are, are making a comeback. And then mucosal exposure devices. Uh, there's a lot of these. You, you have probably seen them uh, around your unit. The idea of this is that it helps you see behind folds um, where polyps, especially in the right colon, tend to go hiding. And, and there's a variety of things. Uh, last year, uh, Doug Rex presented at DDW this really uh, nice head-to-head -head study of different mucosal exposure devices, um, including endocuff and endorings, a fuse system, and then a, just a standard Olympus HD scope. And I think it's important to just sort of see the, the, the main take-home from this is that fuse under, well, there's two main take-homes. Fuse underperformed all of the Olympus by itself versus Olympus plus cap, right? So really that better viewing that you get with that uh, high quality, uh, wide angle, high definition scope was uh, superior to Fuse. But when you compare the two mucosal exposure devices, which is endocuff and endorings, endocuff uh, outperformed endorings, right? So you're not gonna see this kind of study very often. It's actually very challenging to compare this many things um, in, in one study. But this really answers a lot of questions. There's, there's no role for sort of that uh, older generation fuse compared to these mucosal exposure devices. Um, the main question again comes back to, are you finding more important polyps with endocuff or not? And how does it work for the rest of us compared to just the experts who did this study? But if you're gonna be looking at something, endocuff is, is the one that uh, outperformed the others in this study. So shifting from the polyp detection, that's obviously a very important thing, but polyp resection is also uh, getting to be more and more uh, of a hot topic. So we've known this now for about a, a decade at least, uh, but uh, Heiko Pohl showed in a nice study in gastro in 2013 that when you look at the incomplete resection rate of polyps, it varies between the colonoscopist who does the polypectomy. So say that another way, take polyps out, we biopsy the polypectomy site. One endoscopist 23% of the time had residual polyp at the polypectomy site and the best performing endoscopist had it there 6.5% of the time, right? So there's that variation in polypectomy performance between colonoscopists. And a nice study out of UCSD that just came out this year shows that even for small polyps, polyps five millimeters or less, that the incomplete resection rate overall was 10%. They actually showed in this study that jumbo forceps and cold snare had similar uh, incomplete resection rates, which is a, a different uh, topic. But 10% of the time we remove polyps five, per, five millimeters or less, we're leaving some polyp behind. So we actually need to improve our polypectomy as a, as a group for all polyps. Um, there's ways to measure polypectomy scale. There's this something called direct observation of polypectomy skills, which again goes through the core skills of how we perform polypectomy, ensuring that we get a good look at um, um, the field and, and we apply all good technique. In our center, when we actually videotaped all of our colonoscopists, we found a few different things, and I'm gonna sort of walk you through this. The first thing we found is that people who are very good at detecting polyps, so if someone with an ADR of 46%, may not be that great at removing polyps, right? These are unique skills. So just because I can find polyps doesn't mean I can remove them well. And just because I'm not as good at finding polyps doesn't mean that I can't remove them well once they're found, right? So these are unique skills that both need, uh, that work. And the second is the, the obvious thing, which is that um, we have work to do uh, at, at our center as well to improve the skill of polypectomy. Uh, we can do better uh, because our core skills uh, need a little bit of work. So how do we do that? 
Uh, again, I think video coaching is something to consider. Uh, we, we did a similar concept where we actually videotaped colonoscopists and then we gave them feedback. This is someone using regular forceps to remove a polyp and we sort of show them how when you use regular forceps that there's residual polyp there and then you have to keep doing multiple pieces which is gonna ultimately increase your rate of uh, residual neoplasia. And so we give these five to six minute uh, didactic videos and try to uh, show uh, how we can improve our skill uh, to, uh, to achieve high quality polypectomy. Um, and so this sort of feedback, I think, gives people a direction of how they can actually get better. Um, and we also show things like how to use optimal technique uh, and, um, uh, and give them their scores relative to their, to their um, colleagues. And we show that when you give this sort of feedback, we can actually improve polypectomy technique, right? The main thing we, show, we showed was that people stopped using uh, regular forceps once they saw video examples of what happens when you use regular forceps for diminutive polyps, and that people started to, to use more cold snare or jumbo forceps as appropriate for small polyps. But we still have a lot of work to do for larger polyps, so it's gonna be require more than just giving this sort of feedback. So shifting from the small or diminutive polyp, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the changing landscape of uh, endoscopic resection. So uh, we talked uh, a lot yesterday on traditional endoscopic mucosal resection, which is injecting uh, solution into the submucosal space and removing the polyp with a snare. But uh, it's very confusing now. It's a confusing time for endoscopists because uh, a lot of work on cold EMR and underwater EMR and then you saw a really nice uh, examples yesterday from late of full thickness resection. Um, and then uh, I'm, I'm not even, I don't have the energy to talk about ESD and how this fits into this whole paradigm. There's just a lot going on. So we're gonna sort of work through how this uh, information is coming out these days. So cold EMR uh, is something you're reading a lot about in the, la in the last year in the literature. Again, this is not cold snare polypectomy. This is cold EMR for large polyps. Um, this is generally applied for sessile serrated polyps, and your goal is to basically eliminate the risk of post-polypectomy bleeding, because this can be quite high, as, large, as high as 5% in these large right-sided lesions. So what does that look like? Uh, this is an example of cold uh, EMR. This is a somewhat challenging position. This scope is in retroflexion here, um, and there's a serrated polyp that I hope you saw right here. Um, this is another nice example of when you can't see the borders of a serrated polyp, how uh, fantastic chromo, uh, sorry, a methylene blue dye is to outline the borders of a serrated polyp. You can now see that serrated polyp much better after injecting the methylene blue with saline. Again, we're in retroflexion. We're using a dedicated cold snare to perform piecemeal polypectomy. So you're not gonna take large bites, you're essentially taking small bites here, and you're working your way along the serrated polyp uh, to try to remove it in its entirety. So, so, so a, a first bite, a little oozing, some people uh, will add a little epinephrine to their injectate uh, to try to reduce some of that oozing you're seeing. Again, working our way along the last resection site to perform the next resection. If you take too big of a piece, these snares can get stuck because again, you're not using cautery at all. You can see there, we're also uh, you know, getting the polyp piece by piece. You'll see some of these submucosal fibers. And you'll see another resection here, and then you'll see the defect at the end. And again, the concept is that I'm not using cautery. There's essentially 0% risk of delayed bleeding. I don't need to uh, clip this defect closed at all. So a theoretical cost saving uh, and uh, you know, time saving as well. And so you can see at the end, uh, after we've washed away all the polyp, you can see the defect, um, some blood vessels there, uh, but no, uh, no residual neoplasia. And um, you know, we did not clip the defect closed and, and no bleeding at all. But this is being studied, and we'll go sort of go over the, the best data that was presented at DDW on this this year, which is another meta-analysis. I'm just gonna walk you through this because um, this data is gonna get um, uh, a little bit more mature over the next uh, few years, but the cold EMR outcomes are on this right column here. So the recurrence rate of cold EMR for serrated polyps was only 1% uh, uh, out of these 112 patients who had cold EMR. And the immediate bleeding rate was 1% and there was no delayed bleeding. 
So that's a very favorable recurrence rate compared to hot EMR, which doesn't quite make sense. But uh, at the very least, it's not a, a higher recurrence rate. And you can see the delayed bleeding rate for polyps of greater than two centimeters is about three and a half percent. So if we can reliably get our recurrence rate to at least approximate traditional EMR, which data is suggesting um, we can do, we can potentially save time and money uh, by uh, adopting cold EMR. Most of us have been talking about it for serrated polyps and not adenomas, um, but this is going to be studied in another multi-center sort of national trial um, before I think it's sort of widespread use. But this is a very exciting option uh, as a potential a shift in where we're going. And so then there's also this concept of underwater EMR. Uh, and so again, you saw a nice example of that yesterday from Dr. Chang. The whole concept of underwater EMR is we're going to use heat, but we're not going to use a submucosal injection, right? So this was first described by Ken Binmore at CPMC. A lot of publications since then. And there's been some good retrospective data suggesting it's useful. Uh, but there's really no good prospective randomized data until the last couple of years. And I'll show you what that looks like. Here's the rationale. Um, you see the idea that uh, when you uh, place the polyp underwater, it keeps a bit of a polypoid configuration and that you can actually snare the polyp off without an injection. And because you're not over distending the colon, there's no risk of uh, capturing the muscle with the snare. And then when you inject a polyp, you do get a nice lift. You get that protective lift, but it actually makes the polyp quite flat still. It doesn't give you that polypoid configuration of the polyp. It just uh, gives you that protection against the muscle layer. So what does that look like? This is a, a, a very challenging example of underwater EMR. So this is a uh, polyp at the ileocecal valve, and you can see um, the adenomatous change sort of circumferentially around the um, IC valve. And these are among the most challenging polyps, uh, I think, to remove endoscopically. Um, and if you inject, what tends to happen is you just tend to lose your visualization. So after the polyp is marked, um, you can see uh, the snare opened and uh, essentially just taking off pieces of tissue one at a time in sequential order without any injection, right? So without, uh, with underwater, you see um, uh, much easier to grab the tissue because it's retained the, the, the natural folds of, of that part of the body. So we're removing piece by piece. The goal isn't necessarily to remove everything. And, I mean, you obviously can't remove a circumferential ICV uh, anoma in one piece. But the goal is essentially to work yourself along the borders of the last uh, resection onto the next one. You can again see that adenomatous change. No air, no, uh, no CO2, just water uh, all the way around. You'll see it take off another piece here. Um, now, the, the difference in this technique is we're using cautery, so we're not necessarily eliminating the, uh, we're not eliminating the uh, bleeding risk. What we're really trying to do is actually just achieve uh, a resection. And then I think this is the last piece I'll show you where we're taking off, and then I'll show you the final picture of how we can sort of work on this challenging area. Again, just working along the borders of the last uh, polypectomy. You see cutting through. So you can see here that you have the entire uh, rim of the ICV now resected of uh, polyp, right? So um, that's very hard to do with injection was relatively easy to do with uh, underwater EMR. So underwater EMR is my sort of go-to in all cases where there's scarring and submucosal lift um, won't be possible because of the scarring. It's also something to consider um, in polyps that are at the ICV and uh, at the appendiceal orifice. So what data is there to support this at DGW last year? Um, this nice multi-center study came out, which was an interim analysis showing that underwater EMR had higher on-block resection rates, 51% compared to 26%. Um, and this is an underwater EMR experts, just to, just to clarify. Um, and uh, less often required sort of these adjunctive rescue therapies to remove residual polyp. And then in terms of uh, resection time was significantly less than when you use conventional EMR. Uh, and then even more uh, sort of impactful data has just come out um, in gastro, I believe, uh, just a month ago, 
which is comparing underwater EMR and conventional EMR for one to two centimeter polyps, right? So that's like the advanced adenomas that we often see. And, uh, you know, you can see a couple of important findings here. And th these are, they actually had a nice study where they had about half of the people were experts and half of the people were uh, more conventional endoscopists. And uh, they showed that the on-block resection rate was 89% for uh, underwater EMR and 75% for conventional EMR. So significantly higher on-block resection rate for underwater EMR and a significantly uh, greater R0 resection rate when they biopsy the, the edges, right? So less incomplete resection. And there was similar bleeding rates in both groups, no perforation in either group. And in a nice uh, sort of uh, uh, subgroup analysis, you can see that really underwater EMR outperformed conventional EMR in all settings. Right colon versus left colon, uh, sessile, both superficial, larger polyps, a centimeter and a half to two centimeters, you know, regardless of the institution in, in most regards. And then I think importantly, you know, it was uh, more efficacious both for expert endoscopists and non-expert endoscopists, right? So that's a really key finding. How do we make ourselves make sure that this works in all hands and, and actually uh, at least had a signal that non-expert endoscopists did better with uh, underwater EMR than conventional EMR? It's certainly no evidence that they did worse. So this is exciting um, because, again, it's faster and potentially more effective, which is really a, a dream for any endoscopic intervention. And then what about full thickness resection? As I said, Leith showed a really nice example of this uh, yesterday, or two examples. This is the idea that we can simultaneously prepare for a perforation um, and then take off the, the, the full thickness of the colon wall. The idea is that you have a preloaded clip onto your cap you're grasping tissue into the cap, deploying the clip. So if you see in this, this figure right here, you've basically uh, brought muscle to muscle here, serosa to serosa, and, uh, and then you've, you have a sneer that's preloaded into the cap that will now cut above that, right? So essentially, it, the idea is you're creating a full thickness uh, closure and then uh, uh, perforating the colon. It's a sort of a, a, a unique concept, right? So what does that mean? It basically it means that if you have a deep submucosal invasion or even uh, cancer into the muscularis propria, you could potentially remove that uh, cancer uh, by doing a full thickness resection without ever having luminal contents get exposed to the periclonic space. And this would be for someone who is just not a candidate for colectomy and has deep submucosal invasion, and you're gonna take that chance of low risk of lymph nodes or you're trying to stage better um, a nice uh, study at DDW this year showed out of 156 T1 cancers, but 92% of the time they were able to perform a full thickness resection, and you know about uh, you know 50, uh, 98 patients, so about two thirds of these T1 cancers were managed endoscopically only, so saved them from having a colectomy, and for the other third. Um, who had very high risk features, they were able to safely get colectomy later, right? So this is another exciting uh, opportunity for uh, endoscopic interventions and minimally invasive procedures. And so uh, I'm just gonna touch briefly on artificial intelligence in the couple minutes I have left. There's many people in this room who are uh, uh, more, have more expertise in this than I do. I just think it's important for us to understand uh, that this is coming. Um, Dr. Higgins is in the audience and he can talk to you more about this idea that AI allows unsupervised com computer algorithms to do specific tax tasks that traditionally required a human brain. We all know that. The, the real concept of AI that I think is why, uh, the reason why everyone's talking about it now is that we've made this leap, right? In the past, uh, you know, we've been had the processing power to say, you know, something is a, a, a cat or something is a dog, but actually trying to differentiate what type of cat and what type of dog it is has been a bit of a challenge. And, and with better uh, computer processing, we're really able to differentiate these subspecies just like polyps, right? It's not enough for um, AI to just tell us something's a polyp. We want it to tell us whether it's an adenoma, a serrated polyp, whether it's an adenocarcinoma. And we've made those leaps over the last couple of years. Just to ensure we stay in time, I'm just gonna show you some of the important work that's been done over the last uh, um, uh, year or two, um, present at DDW. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the bottom abstract uh, is from the, uh, uh, the Irvine group showing that you can actually utilize uh, this, these AI systems 
to calculate insertion times, sequel intubation times, and withdrawal times you know, during live colonoscopy using these convolutional neural networks. So basically, all the work of trying to assess some of these quality metrics can be done by computers. And what, what's interesting is uh, they actually showed that the computers did better than when we were manually inputting withdrawal times, right? So oftentimes in our center, we, you know, the, the, the nurse or tech forgets to hit the button to start the withdrawal time. When the experts review them, you can get a really accurate withdrawal time uh, that's, that, that has uh, that better accuracy than the, than the ones we're entering into our data sets now. And AI systems like this can actually calculate those withdrawal times and inspection times for us uh, with higher accuracy. I think it's important to understand that we still need to do a lot to uh, reduce ADR variability. And again, that's another place that, uh, that artificial intelligence can help us. You know, when we, when we started collecting ADRs at our center six years ago, you saw wide variability in ADRs from 10 to 50%. And we're going to need things beyond training that can help us because we have people who are, are doing a good job, spending a lot of time, but, but we, we need some sort of real-time feedback to say, oh, that polyp that you might not have seen is, is sitting right there. And again, AI is, there's a lot of efforts now uh, to see AI uh, with polyp detection. Um, you saw, again, uh, some nice uh, examples of this, and there's a, a nice study in gastro from last year from the Irvine group as well that you see on the bottom right. I'm showing that you know we can really identify polyps in real time with uh, sc during screening colonoscopy. Um, there's another article uh, that you see here. Essentially, the, the concept is that you use these training sets to help the computers identify what a polyp is or not, and then when you actually now use the artificial intelligence, they tend to outperform the actual experts, right? So in this in this study. Uh, the experts re-reviewed these colonoscopy videos and found, uh, I think, about eight more polyps that the initial endoscopist didn't, found, uh, didn't find. And when the artificial intelligence system then looked at the videos, they found you know, approximately 15 to 20 more polyps that neither the initial endoscopist or the expert found, right? So the computers are there to you know, give us that backup, and I think that's important feedback for us when we're performing the colonoscopy. Um, and so you can see another example uh, this year showing that when you used a computer-aided detection during colonoscopy, you can improve the uh, polyp detection rate. And finally, I think it's important to understand that we're, uh, computers are going to be able to help us classify polyps better. And this is a real win for me, because I think the way we need to move in colonoscopy is this resect and discard concept, where we look at a polyp with high confidence, say it's a six millimeter adenoma, remove it and don't send it to the pathologist that incurs an unnecessary cost for the system. And so I think computers are gonna be able to do this. They, they are doing this now, uh, correctly identifying differentiating adenomas versus hyperplastic polyps. This is what it would look like in real time. This is from Video GIE this year. <coughs> you also saw a nice example of this yesterday. So essentially a polyp is identified. You do near focus, look at the polyp, and this is with endocystoscopy, which was actually basically doing a microscopic biopsy at that time, and saying with high probability, 99%, this is a neoplastic polyp, but there's no evidence that this is a carcinoma, so we could remove it, um, give the patient their you know, five-year follow-up right at this time of this procedure, and move on. We don't have to wait for pathology two to three days later and the associated cost. Thank you. <laughs>